All right. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces on the participant list, so that's a, that's a smile from, uh, from this end. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your uh, evening for, uh, to, to listen to this presentation. Uh, those of you that don't know, my name is Matt McMahon. I'm a disaster and communication specialist uh, with a healthcare coalition here in North Carolina. Uh, my background is I'm a retired fireman and paramedic, and uh, I've done pretty much everything, uh, all different types of uh, everything on the emergency services side, and uh, that's, uh, that's that. Uh, information sharing, uh, traffic light protocol, some of you may be used to seeing this and some not, but just so we have it all straight, everything on here is listed as TLP white, which means there's nothing restricted in any uh, type of uh, information that we don't want out on the internet, things like that has been redacted. So uh, it's, it's clean to share. All right. So uh, this, I always like to do this in the beginning of the classes and uh, uh, the, the rule of thumb. And usually uh, most people, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that's a, a good thing to live by. And as much as we plan, things change. And when you get punched in the face, uh, that plan uh, is gone. And now you need a new plan. Uh, so we're going to, uh, through this whole presentation, we're going to talk about the importance of establishing plans, exercising, updating plans. So just because we make a plan and if we don't update it, that's, uh, that's almost a big, it's almost as good as not having a plan. And then ensure plans are written. So just because uh, Carter has, and I'm going to pick on a few people since I know uh, a few, just because Carter has it in his mind in Hawaii, uh, if that plan is not written down, and uh, if something happens to Carter, then uh, it's pretty much starting from scratch. So make sure that stuff's written down. Most importantly, though, flying by the seat of our pants is not a plan. And we'll talk uh, about that. All right. So tonight's uh, topic is how MCOM is leveraged in healthcare. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what the healthcare coalition is, what we do and then how the amateur radio and emergency MCOM communications fall into it. I'm not one for reading slides, but this one I'll, I'll read to you. is uh, Healthcare coalitions are groups of local health and uh, responder organizations uh, that work together on challenges to find solutions to improve emergency preparedness and response uh, and health and safety in their communities. And uh, they reflect the unique needs of healthcare and uh, especially with facilities uh, uh, to plan, organize, equip, train, and uh, ensure they're prepared in the region. So really, uh, after COVID really brought all this to light, so healthcare coalitions uh, surfaced back up to be a very important uh, member in the community and, and still continue. One thing that's uh, interesting is not all states do healthcare coalitions the same. So we're going to talk about um, how we do it here in North Carolina, and then, of course, uh, some other states do it completely different. All right, so here in North Carolina, uh, these are all the different healthcare coalition regions. So what you see over on your right is uh, our healthcare coalition, which is the Eastern Healthcare Preparedness Coalition, and that comprises of about 29 counties and 18 hospitals. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you probably know for uh, during the summer, spring, fall, and summer, we get hurricanes here. So we stay pretty busy as it relates to healthcare and communications. We drill down a little bit deeper in that region. These are all the hospitals that we support. And uh, for the most part, Eastern North Carolina is pretty rural. So uh, a lot of these are community-based hospitals and are really a lifeline of, uh, of the communities. And if you look on the uh, eastern, on the Outer Banks section, you can see it's uh, very, very sparse there. So it gets very interesting how we provide health care and communications. So what do we focus on uh, in the healthcare coalition? There are really these four capabilities. And the one I want you to, to focus on is, is capability two, and that's um, 
healthcare and I'm going to move this chat box out of my view here. Uh, capability to healthcare and medical response coordination. And that is where communication support falls in. And we're going to talk about preparedness and response. Those are two different, two different things. But so everything we do in the healthcare coalition has to uh, follow one of these capabilities. It's just like grant funding, anything else. We have to tie it to one of those capabilities. This is our uh, regional operations center. It's a large warehouse and it is full. Last I checked, there was probably about $8 million worth of assets uh, under the roof. And uh, you can see the what we call the mother bird down there in the bottom. Uh, that essentially is a large 53 foot tractor trailer with belly boxes and an 80 kW generator slung off the front. And that is a mobile 50 bed uh, field hospital. So in there, there's uh, Western shelter tents and uh, there's actually six of those uh, 19 by 35 Western shelter tents in there. So this is, uh, and we carry everything from uh, x-ray ultrasound, uh, uh, a lot of, it, it essentially is a field disaster hospital. A lot of people say, well, what is that? And the best way I can describe it is probably everybody on this call remembers uh, the show MASH. And uh, it's literally MASH. Uh, it's just not olive drab, uh, tents, and, uh, you know, all that stuff. So that's that's essentially what we do. And you can see all different types of trailers we have, vehicles. We actually have a mobile, uh, a medical ambulance bus uh, that we can actually take 26 people at a time. We use that for uh, a variety of different things. So uh, while we're looking at this picture, you can just imagine the amount of communications that has to occur internally among all of this. So we have doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, we have logistics people. Um, so that has to occur. And then when we do have degradations or outages, then we have to figure out how to fit that MCOM role into it. And uh, every vehicle that you see there uh, has, has amateur radio or some type of uh, MCOM asset on it as well. All right, uh, this is the, uh, we call it MRPs, a mission ready package. And this essentially is, if you were going to order something, this is your, your, your book on resources. So if you want to order a, a portable morgue trailer because your, your morgue at your hospital has, has something wrong with the cooling, uh, if you need a light package, generator package, uh, anyway, you can go online on our website, which is easternhpc.com. Uh, and uh, there are some areas you should be able to pull this mission ready package. But from a comm perspective, uh, from auxiliary communications and MCOM, this is a really cool thing to do. Uh, so especially when you're working with emergency management is, uh, <laughs> and we're going to talk about um, later when, when I go to presentate and do presentations, I always ask folks, I said, what, what is it that you do here? And uh, you can have a document like this, and these are all the services, uh, whether it's hardware or manpower, that you can provide to an emergency manager uh, or anybody that's requesting it. So uh, feel free to take a look at that. And um, yeah, uh, so here I have it circled on the left-hand side. We have, these are the two areas that in a, in a disaster, these are the two areas we focus on. So one of them is preparedness and the other one is response. Like I said earlier, not all states do both of them. Uh, many healthcare coalitions do just the preparedness side and not the response. So we're a little bit unique. There's some other states, uh, Mississippi's another, and I think Missouri may be another uh, that actually have a fairly large response component as well. Uh, but our, our neighbors uh, up to the North Virginia, uh, they're, you know, they, they do have some assets, but a lot of it is more on the preparedness side. All right, so some of the, re the resources we have here, just to give you an idea before we get in the MCOM topic, is uh, uh, we've got an old uh, critical care ambulance neonatal truck that was uh, converted into a comm truck. And, you know, the summary on it is uh, it, it can do just about everything. Uh, the, we even have interconnects for 
uh, green radios, if we do anything with the military, uh, but there's literally every band, every mode uh, on that vehicle. So uh, everything from aviation to, uh, it's just, it's a tremendous amount of gear, cellular repeaters, point to point bridges. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about a pace plan further, but, uh, you know, so our, most of the time, if the internet's not working, our second line is going to be, you know, some type of cellular backhaul. So we have quad carrier uh, cradle points and bonding modems that, uh, you know, that has first net that we can, we can use that. And then we fall back to satellite. And uh, forever, the, the standard has been uh, VSAT in, in the disaster response world. But lately, uh, we, we have transitioned over to Starlink and we'll, We'll talk more about that, but that's really been a just a tremendous asset for uh, for us here. And then uh, portable phone systems, and so this this vehicle here is not a command post. This this vehicle is a essentially a work truck for the communication unit to supply the request and resources to wherever we're going. So if we're going to a hospital that's busted with uh, data or uh, an incident or an emergency uh, operation center, this is, uh, this is really the tool to support that. And of course, we load, we can't fit everything in this truck. Uh, so whether it's, we have portable repeaters and it, it just goes on and on, uh, we load that according to what the mission is. So we, we fill out a checklist ahead of the mission. And if we're going to a hospital that's busted with communications, I know I'm gonna need phones, I know I'm gonna need Wi-Fi. Uh, we're going to talk about shares and WinLink and, and things like that. So, and there's just another picture of uh, the inside. The other thing that's worth mentioning is uh, audio gateways. So all the radios that you see, we have the ability to patch and interconnect those into any other radios. And that includes HF, uh, aviation, um, all the radios you see there. And this picture on the left was actually uh, me. Um, it doesn't look like there's a lot going on there, but that actually was post uh, Hurricane Florence, I believe. And I actually had to go down to one of the regional hospitals. They had no communications, uh, zero, and actually had to provide them uh, phone, voice, and data for about four days until the uh, vendors could get everything repaired. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting when you pull up to a facility and they're used to working with gig, uh, you know, fiber and, and things like that. And you pull up with a, you know, equipment that we can do anywhere from 20 to 150 megs down. Uh, we have to be very selective on, on how we provide that connectivity. So most of the time, the, the EOC or their command center, and then we'll selectively give them data to look at electronic health records and things like that. So they can at least uh, provide care in an appropriate way. Uh, and here's a picture of uh, those are the tents and those of you that that have been doing uh, uh, emergency response you probably have seen these before uh, western shelter and that's actually a dlx tent in the front and this is actually we do a lot of air shows and uh, we have a lot of air bases here in north carolina and this actually looks like it was seymour johnson air force base and we usually set up a field hospital for those events and most of the time it's hot and they get 100 to 200,000 people that show up on a hot tarmac. And uh, for whatever reason, not the healthiest people show up at those events. And uh, so we try to mitigate that and um, we try to treat and treat as many patients as we can at those type of events. We don't want to relocate the disaster. So let's just say we have 50 uh, patients that have a heat emergency we don't want to just pack those 50 patients up and relocate them to the hospital. That just, all that did is just move the disaster. So that's, that's why we try to, to help with this. Uh, the picture on the right, we have a pile of gateways that are spread throughout the region. And if you look on that, it's, uh, and those of you that don't know what the audio gateways are, it's a, it's a patch unit. So it's essentially taking two or four wire audio and, and patching that. And uh, here, we actually, there's some, some amateur resources that are in that stack. And, uh, you know, do we do that on a daily basis? No, but we have the ability. 
So if there is a disaster and we have to patch that stuff together, uh, we, we definitely can do that. And uh, from a seasoned uh, responder in the field, you know, when it comes to rules and regulations in a disaster, we, we always err on life safety, property conservation, incident stabilization. So if I have to talk or somebody has to talk on a radio that may not particularly be licensed, if somebody's life is uh, in danger, uh, you go ahead and do it and we'll figure out the rest later. And that's the stance uh, we take. So um, here's a list of uh, resources that we do have in this region. And we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about DMR. That's a whole topic in itself. And, uh, uh, but we do have a, a pretty robust, and these are not even all the circles here, uh, system of DMR that's uh, at all the hospitals, repeaters. And we also have analog, and uh, we have shares wind link at the level one trauma center here in Greenville. And that's, that's a major asset for us. And here is, uh, here's a picture of the hospital that you see on the left. And you could see kind of where in that region that hospital sits. And uh, we use, uh, so SHARES Windlink, and those of you that are not familiar with the SHARES program, uh, it works out very well in this type of uh, situation because uh, individual users are not licensed, but the agency is licensed. So if I drop this uh, drop kit off at a regional hospital that's busted, as long as I give somebody the enough training to figure out how to send and receive the, the, the message, uh, they can do it. And uh, so if, if it happens to be a nurse, a doctor, uh, whatever. So we have a variety of shares drop kits that we can position throughout the region and, uh, and utilize that. So that's a very big asset for us. And in our PACE plan, that is one of our uh, main items. And here you can see the uh, the truck on the bottom, and we happen to have a, uh, that's actually a horse fence uh, antenna, actually, for Mr. Uh, Tom Brown in 4TAB, and uh, you can see that um, in use there. We have a variety of uh, different antennas. All right, so uh, that shares RMS, mobile wind link. You can see the uh, hospital station here on our right. And that's pretty much the antenna farm for that level one trauma center. And uh, there's a whole room dedicated to that. And here on the left, you know, we're, we're not supposed to share, but, you know, so much of this information, but it gives you an idea visually in the region where those uh, RMS stations are. So if comms is completely uh, busted, uh, we know we at least uh, have those areas we can reach back to. And of course, all the other ones that you see. Uh, across Region 4 and Region 5. Um, all right, what else do we do is uh, we talked about air shows. You can see the picture on the left. Yeah, we do a lot of those. Uh, we do marathons, so the Outer Banks Marathon. That's a pretty big event. We do that. And, of course, emergency incident support. Uh, we have a lot of single resource missions, so there may be a specific. Uh, they may be doing a swift order recovery where they're, you know, looking for somebody that's drowned and they may have poor data wherever they're at. So we may bring some tools out there. And so we have a lot of single resource uh, missions like that. And then the picture on the bottom is actually, that's a full blown field hospital deployment. And that was actually at the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte. Uh, and that was a few years back, but that's a massive operation right there. And there's actually mobile OR suites and uh, so that's that's a uh, that's a big operation. So you can imagine, uh, you know, if you can imagine all that in the bottom right, uh, there's a lot of com resources to have to work through with that. All right. So other common things we use, uh, we talked about cradle points. We have a lot of field deployable cases, and uh, most of them have quad carriers. So uh, Verizon, FirstNet. Uh, it could be we we have a one here U.S. Cellular and what's the fourth one? Could be I don't even remember. The main players are Verizon and First Net Force. What's what's convenient about these is we can carry those, and a lot of times, as long as some type of cellular is working, 
instead of bringing an entire vehicle, we can bring one of these cases, set it down at a command center or a uh, EOC, and we can plug a Google Voice phone into it uh, or really anything else we need. We can fly a switch off it, you know, put 24 port switch, uh, put a call manager. So it's really fully independent and a very, very useful tool. Some other things we have uh, a variety of test equipment. So we, uh, you know, we, we kind of consider when we go down range, there's uh, you, you're on your own and, and uh, no, nobody's coming. Uh, so it's, uh, we're, we're prepared to, to handle most things. Uh, we have all repair, uh, spectrum analyzers, tracking generators, uh, everything to uh, tune and adjust things in the field. Some two new tools that we have that's pretty cool is, uh, and one of them is not really new, but is a portable PBX conference bridge. So, you know, all of us probably use WebEx and uh, different types of conference bridges like this one, Zoom, but a simple audio conference bridge. And we can put this on the truck and we can, you know, backhaul this over satellite. So as long as we have some type of connectivity to the outside world, which it's rare we don't, uh, here's your conference bridge. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a cool little tool. It's a Raspberry Pi, running uh, free B, free uh, PBX software. It's a uh, it's a neat little device. The other one that's new is uh, the Kraken uh, S SDR direction finding uh, hardware. And uh, those of you that have not seen this, this is a very uh, affordable uh, time of arrival uh, direction finding tool. Uh, so you can uh, use this. I forget what the lowest is, but it goes up to about, uh, I think, 1.5 or 2 gigs. But we have a lot of issues where, uh, for instance, we'll, we had issues with GPS. Uh, we have five helicopters here in our hospital system. And when they were landing, uh, interference was causing them to completely lose their GPS signals. So we had to chase that down. Of course, then uh, FAA is involved, FCC is involved. And it's just a big uh, team effort to figure that out. So this is a very, very cheap, cost-effective direction-finding tool that uh, works very well so far from our experiences. I mentioned it earlier, Starlink. That's another tool we use. Probably some of you on this call have it, may even be using it to watch this presentation. This is just a game changer. It's, uh, you know, with a VSAT, we were looking at 15 to 20 megs down. Uh, per second, and even on a bad day with with deprioritized service, you know I, I don't think I've ever seen it below thirty megs uh, for us here. Uh, and then some days it's uh, one one fifty, uh, and you could set it up in a matter of uh, three four minutes, and uh, you know run it into whatever your uh, WAN connection is of your network, and uh, bam, you've got you've got internet with very low latency. Uh, something else we do here is uh, for the hospitals, we put satellite telephones in uh, a majority of the hospitals, and they're not all the same, which is a little bit of a disadvantage, but uh, MSAT and MARSAT or Iridium, uh, we just want to ensure that they have a way to contact, um, pretty much request help when, when all their lifelines uh, go down. So what else do we do? Uh, we provide advice to uh, emergency managers. Uh, we work with federal agencies. We work with Coast Guard, uh, all sorts of different folks, and, and provide them uh, uh, general guidance. We do have uh, a few trunked radio systems that we maintain and a variety of BDAs, uh, bidirectional amplifiers, which are pretty much building amplifiers. And uh, so they're scattered all across hospitals. And then the Amateur radio, the Oxcom sites, we have 21 different repeater sites in the region. Uh, so that's a full-time job almost, just trying to keep all that stuff going. Uh, one of our biggest issues is connectivity. So uh, putting equipment at a healthcare facility is really good because it's, uh, it's a pretty robust uh, facility usually. They have good dedicated backup uh, power and they have good internet, but in today's world with cybersecurity, it, it just gets very challenging to do some of the things that we do uh, with, with MCOM and repeaters. 
And like I said, we have five uh, aircraft that we also uh, program and handle any communication issues with. That's a picture of one of them up there. Uh, another thing we do, monthly testing. So all the hospitals uh, in the region, we actually test their statewide trunk radio system monthly. And we make sure that all that equipment is good. And if it's not, we, uh, we get them some loaner equipment until they can uh, get their uh, items repaired. So this is, uh, this by no means is this new, but in, in the emergency services world, this is a little bit new, is PACE planning. And uh, we have a, a variety of PACE plans. This is a very strategic PACE plan, but uh, we actually look at our primary alternate contingent and emergency methods of communication. And most people think, oh, that may just be voice or that may be just radio, but that's not. So we, we have voice, we have data, you know, so internet, and then also uh, information sharing platforms. So as a response team, if we're going to dispatch, uh, you know, uh, members of the team out, if uh, plan A is not working, you know, what's plan B, C, and D. Uh, so that's, uh, this is a little quick reference card. And we actually have one that goes much more in depth for actual frequencies. And, uh, but that's a very good thing to have is, is as simple as that is, is, uh, a four-layer uh, solution to any of your challenges. All right, something else that's available on the uh, website, and we, we can uh, ensure that's uh, put up here with the presentation, is there's a document called the Communications uh, Best Practice and Information Sharing Plan. Uh, we published this for the region, and it is it essentially is a uh, full, I, I hate to call it the great big book of everything, but it's, it's a uh, book on everything that a emergency manager, uh, a hospital, an EMS agency, fire, uh, all the big things that they need to know in the region and, um, and then how we integrate into that. And that, of course, falls in the preparedness section. Some of the specialty areas that we do, um, all these aircraft that you see on the page here, uh, we actually uh, do all of the technical programming for uh, all of these aircraft when they come in for a disaster. So here in North Carolina, we do have a variety of Coast Guard bases. We do have one Coast Guard Air Station, which is Elizabeth City, and they have a variety of uh, fixed-wing C-130s and uh, MH-60 Jayhawks. And we do the programming, uh, we assist those guys with programming the state trunk radio system in those. And uh, they use that daily, and it's a very, very big tool for them. And then all these other aircraft that you see are, you know, over a period of time, uh, we've, we've had our hands on and, and helped with. And there's a, there's a really nice letter here from the uh, commanding officer of the uh, air station and pretty much uh, thanked us for... Um, the amount of hours and things we've done and then the amount of impact it had during rescue operations during some of the hurricanes. Uh, so it's nice. It's uh, so, you know, as you can see from this, this is uh, this is a whole lot going on here, whether it's all the way from amateur radio to dealing with uh, federal and state assets uh, with, with uh, technical programming. So how do we support healthcare is uh, we talked about the two areas, preparedness and response. Uh, we help a lot of agencies with their uh, coop planning or continuity of operations. And then the, obviously the response and all that feeds into uh, state emergency management and the ESF2 section. And uh, those of you should remember uh, ESFs, what they stand for, emergency support functions in the state. And, um, that is essentially who is responsible for what lane of, uh, uh, of issue that is. Uh, something else we do, we do semi-annual COMEXs or communication exercises. Uh, we actually had one yesterday, and we deployed the uh, truck out into one of the uh, regional hospitals, and then we had participants from the state uh, remotely uh, work through a list of injects and, uh, and do that. So, you know, this is really good because we get to see where we are with uh, some of the gaps. But, 
you'll have to disregard the dog barking in the background. Hopefully that's not too uh, troublesome. Uh, but we look at all these lanes here of the uh, uh, interoperability continuum is governance, SOPs, technology, trainings, and exercise, and usage. All right. So um, here is a list. Uh, this is probably the most uh, up-to-date map of the we're going to start talking about amateur radio now. And here is uh, all the amateur radio repeaters that we have in the, the region. And what's really cool is we have some repeaters that are very high. Uh, this is relatively all flat land down in eastern North Carolina. And we have some repeaters that are up at uh, 1,200, um, around 1,200 feet on platforms, which is very, uh, very unique. Uh, not a lot of uh, amateur radio groups get to, to put stuff in areas like that. So, uh, But what you see here, the yellow uh, arrow is actually an RF link that connects uh, two of those very high repeaters. And essentially, these circles are bigger than that. Uh, so two main repeaters actually cover a good part of the eastern part of the state. And uh, they're not relying on IP connectivity uh, for those uh, to talk to each other. The, the two red lines are actually point-to-point -point, uh, backhaul IP links. And uh, so that's how we connect that into the rest of the system. And uh, one of those is, uh, let me see, 12 miles, and the other one is 19 miles. And uh, both, of, both of those are about 50 meg connections. And uh, right now, uh, I could actually remote into uh, the big tower that you see on the right the gear up at 1200 feet i could remote into it right now and if you wanted to reprogram it we could do that so very very neat stuff here's a picture of what those towers look like and uh you know somebody said well, how do you put an antenna at, at 1200 feet well uh, actually the whole kit and caboodle is at 1200 feet so the actual cabinet the antenna everything is at 1200 feet and the feed line length is literally 10 feet long uh, so that's a very, uh, very good asset to to have. And that just shows a picture, uh, really hard to see, but that's uh, one of the, the local towers in Farmville, North Carolina. And the little white dot that you see is the level one trauma center that's uh, 12 miles away. And uh, there's an internet connection uh, bridge between those. All right, so uh, some of the, amateur radio resources we have, we were lucky that North Carolina had a older UHF, what they called med system. And it comprised of uh, Tate T-800s. And uh, there was about 35 sites across the state. And all of these were connected via microwave and, uh, and were linked. And this is what hospitals originally used to communicate out uh, with EMS agencies and other hospitals before the statewide trunk system came to fruition. Uh, so, you know, uh, things got old. I uh, don't want to keep all that equipment up. The state decided to, uh, hey, we're going to throw all that in the garbage. Uh, so, oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, don't be doing that. That's uh, So had to do a little bit of paperwork, some justification. And we acquired about 35 of those cabinets, and each cabinet has two full 200 watt um, Tate analog repeaters, UHF. And uh, it's nice dual power supplies, dual PAs, uh, pretty, pretty robust. So we had a, had a good idea. So, hey, how can we turn this into an amateur radio resource? Uh, how can we make it, you know, do analog? How can we make it do DMR? Uh, so the, the big thing with DMR is uh, it, we leverage technology when it's available. And when it's not, we go back to the basics. So um, it took us a little while. And with the help of uh, Tom and 4TAB and, uh, and some other folks, we finally were able to figure out how to make this equipment play and, uh, and use uh, MMDVM technology with it. And I'm, I'm going to be the first to tell you, uh, it's, this is my opinion, uh, is, is MMDVM stuff is, is kind of a hack job, but... Uh, it does work. It just doesn't work as good as some of the native uh, equipment out there. But that there's still a lot of that equipment out there. Uh, the other thing we do is uh, independent hotspots. So uh, 
you know, some of you may already use hotspots, DMR, different types of digital technology. You may be brandmeister in some of those things. Uh, what we're lucky with, and we have our own system, uh, our own servers running, and we actually have a server that proxies those hotspot connections. So just like you connect to Brandmeister, or some of the other big uh, groups out there, we have the same thing. And somebody says, well, you know, in a disaster, why, why do I want that? And the deal is it's all about leveraging technology. So if we can harness that, if I have some type of connectivity to the internet, it doesn't cellular, satellite, I don't care, point to point. Uh, if I can leverage that and use all the on-site radio equipment and pump it back into something else, that's, that's a big resource to have. Uh, some of the differences here, you know, it, this happens to be a Kenwood machine on the left, but uh, like I said, the, the MMDVM stuff works. We have a lot of it out there, but it just does not work as good as uh, native uh, turbo and some of the other equipment out there that is designed for that purpose. So at the end of the day, we're, we're taking all this uh, analog equipment and we're making it do things it was not designed to do. It will do, but um, there are some deficiencies there. All right, some of the dashboards we have, uh, you can look these up. Uh, we have a website, uh, nc4es.org. So the, the club call of the Healthcare Coalition is nc4es. And uh, that's how we, uh, all of our repeaters are listed that way. And uh, it's a very unique way to get funding for amateur radio is, uh, you know, we consider all these tools as redundant layers of communication for, uh, you know, emergency management and um, which, of course, the funding has really dwindled off here in the last few years. But uh, at any rate, that's uh, that's where some of this uh, funding comes from. But we do have a uh, uh, HB Link server running, and that's running all the MMDVM repeaters. Then we have a Seabridge running all of the native turbo repeaters. And uh, we still have some connections in uh, with uh, uh, some of the folks that's on this call, actually, uh, we're, we're connected with. So, uh, But you can find more information about that on that site, NC4S nc4es.org and uh, we'll go from there all right so here is uh, kind of wrapping up towards the, the final topic is we're going to talk about MCOM and how it relates with emergency management and I'm, I'm just gonna be frank is uh, I, I have no tie to any particular group uh, I am representing uh, emergency management and in the many years of, of things I've done in that area and uh, if, if I offend you, please don't take it personal. And I'm going to tell you a lot about how North, North Carolina does things and uh, how I've seen things done across uh, the country. But, you know, at the end of the day, that we're all here for the same thing, and that's to help with emergency communications. But this great question here is when, you know, if I come to your local ham group for a, a meeting one night to do a brief, and I say, all right, my name is uh, Chief Muldoon. I'm a fire chief here locally. What is it that you do here? And when I ask that question, a lot of people that you know, they look at each other and they're like, uh, we help with, okay, that's great. But tell me more. What is it that you actually do? And uh, believe it or not, a lot of people have problems with that. So you need to pre be prepared to answer that question. What service do you provide? And, and what are you going to do for me as uh, the emergency manager? Uh, so at, at the end of the day, and things have changed, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, but whether it's, we call it EM or EMA, whatever your state calls it, uh, emergency management at the end of the day is who runs the show, uh, period. There, there's no, no question about that. Uh, so with, with auxiliary communications, um, and I'm not going to throw any particular group under the bus, but. Uh, there, there's no hats, there's no stickers, there's no clubs, there's, there's no particular groups in the ICS NIMS environment. And we're going to look at some ICS charts. And uh, I challenge you to look and tell me where, you know, some of these groups uh, are located. And the, I already know the answer. And the answer is nowhere. Um, the only thing you will find is the communication unit and under their auxiliary communications. 
So it really doesn't matter what group you are. You can be Aries, React, uh, Sat. I, I don't know. There's a million of them. I can't even fit them on the page. But at the end of the day, you're there to support emergency communications and uh, auxiliary communications. That's a typed resource under the umbrella. Uh, so I'd, I just, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page there. Um, and if your goal is not to support uh, local, regional, or state emergency management, uh, you really aren't needed when it comes to MCOM. No offense, uh, but you, you've got to have that relationship. And, um, and it's challenging for some folks, and I, I understand that. But no stickers, no hats. We don't have any of that. Uh, where does MCOM or auxiliary communications fit in the picture? And we're going to start, you know, very basic and drill down deeper here. But, you know, you fall, we fall under the communication unit. Uh, so most of the time you work under a COMEL. And uh, those of you that don't know, communication unit leader. And uh, that's, uh, that's where you fall, which is actually in the logistics sh section. And we've always fought for many years. It doesn't make sense being in the logistics section. But at the end of the day, MCOM is there to support the operation. So the people that are saving lives, protecting property, and mitigating the incident, your job is to support them. They don't work for you. All right. So uh, in ICS, we, we probably all know this. You fill the role based on the task. So, you know, uh, here, if you look under lo the logistics section, the food unit, you know, I don't see the word McDonald's, Burger King, uh, any of those listed. So what do you see? The communication unit. So uh, the abbreviations, ARIES, ARRL, all the other ones out there, you will never see those listed in an ICS chart, period. Uh, when you go to an emergency management official and you say, I'm here, I'm the, we'll talk about all these abbreviations, uh, DEC, AEC, SC, I'm the Area 2 DEC, and the emergency manager, manager is going to look at you and go, what? Who? I, I, what do you do? I'm here for communi oh, communications. Okay, well, you're in the comm unit. You need to go talk to this person. Emergency management has no idea about any of that other stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right out of the gate, that's just the way it is. And um, you're not going to find that in an ICS chart. All right, so where does auxiliary communications fit in? And remember, when I say auxcom or auxiliary communications, it's not an agency. It's a task. Okay, so let's be clear on that. So there's no agencies listed anywhere on this chart. It's tasks. So you can see, and this is actually a somewhat newer chart, but um, forever in the IT or communications world, if you look on the right-hand side, now we've added this whole IT part because that's very important. Everything's data-driven these days. So we have uh, you know, the IT support of the incident. And then we have the communication support on the left-hand side. And you can see where auxiliary communications uh, fits in. Remember, no hats, groups, logos in MCOM. It's your task. All right, so what, what I ask or challenge everybody out there is please do not be on a mission to nowhere. Uh, you see here, and I just pulled these off the internet within the last two days, um, and I'm not going to say any specific agencies, but these charts that you see here in the MCOM world in emergency management, they don't exist. Nobody knows what they are. Uh, they, they do not exist and have no bearing on what is trying to be accomplished for emergency management. Uh, please do not be a self-perpetual licking ice cream cone on your own mission. Uh, and that goes back to that question is, what is it that you do here? Um, so remember, your job is to support emergency management. And we're talking about MCOM here. So if you're, you know, if you're a contester and you do all this other stuff, that's absolutely great. But if you're really in MCOM, you really have to understand what the mission is. And your job is there to support uh, emergency management. And here in uh, North Carolina, I want to say Oxcom is probably one of the most versatile communication unit positions uh, in the whole group. And the reason being is a lot of times those operators are doing everything. 
they're uh, doing cash management. They are answering all the amateur side or Oxcom side. They're answering satellite telephones, public safety, statewide trunk system. Uh, they're doing everything. And, you know, it's, uh, it goes back to, there was a, uh, one of the hurricanes in Florida, you know, when, when you go to an incident or you've been requested to come help, when you first show up, you say, how, what can I do to help? And it may not be what you think your job is there to do. You, you may think you're going to string up an HF wire and, and do something else. Nope. Today you're making street signs. Uh, we really need help doing something else. And that's, that's normal. Uh, so you really have to get in the mindset of uh, you're really there to help and serve uh, the greater picture. All right. So what determines if MCOM support works? And, you know, we hear a lot of times that local agencies, you know, I don't have any relationship with my emergency manager, um, you know, or he's a jerk or, you know, whatever else you want to say. Uh, we have to ask ourselves why. So, you know, at the end of the day, all incidents start and end locally, even big, huge incidents. They start locally and they eventually end locally. Uh, you know, does the emergency manager previous experience, does he have a bad taste? He or she have a bad taste in their mouth from people, you know, ahead of you that really uh, uh, mess the situation up? Is it a lack of training? Does the emergency manager maybe not, he may not even heard what Oxcom is. And there's some, there's, there's definitely a lot of those out there because you got to remember that's not in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, world. So, and, and just a lack of understanding, but the important part here is at the end of the day, if you're not engaged with emergency management or the authority having jurisdiction, you will never, ever be called period. Uh, you may help out at a bike race or something, you know, and they, they, they ask you to come out and, uh, you know, be radio checkpoints at a bike race. But when it comes to emergency response, um, the way things have changed these days, personnel have to be trained, vetted, and um, it's just not showing up like it was in, in years past. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too cruel, but that is absolutely true. All right, so general locks, com, facts, and figures for North Carolina. Uh, actually, uh, Tom Brown, uh, uh, the godfather, mentor, great friend, um, they did a presentation already uh, that you can go watch uh, on the Rat Pack, and there's the link to it, and uh, feel free to look at that. But here, just generally, 100% uh, ICS compliance, zero exceptions. So if folks don't want to do the training, sorry, we don't need you. Uh, no non-AHJ uh, organizations. And a big one here is a writ written message delivery within 30 minutes maximum, regardless of the location. And uh, we've done this over the last year, and I'm, I don't want to call out particular groups, uh, but some of the traffic management uh, groups out there, you know, we sent an uh, emergency message um, that was a medication resource request for a hospital. And uh, I believe I got a response from that about 24 hours later. And uh, the conversation went like this. It said, uh, uh, you're trying to get up with the emergency manager at New Hanover uh, County, North Carolina, and pass this message. Uh, I don't have anybody in that area that can pass the traffic. And uh, you provided an address. So the only way I have to drive two hours to go get it. To, to deliver the message. And, you know, at that moment in time, that's a pass or fail. Failed. Uh, that's a fail. So we don't need any, any of this traffic about uh, grandma's wart removal went well and, and, you know, high that shows up 12 or 24 hours later. We need mission critical traffic that's passed immediately in, in a tactical environment. So, um, I caution you for for groups that are trying to get engaged with that. That that's in 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 the response world. That's not what we need. Uh, fully integrated with uh, North Carolina ESF two. Uh, most of the time, Oxcom per, uh, personnel are staffing RCCs and uh, emergency operations center radio positions. Almost always here. 
And uh, of course, you must complete a position task book according to the state standards, not the national standards, the state standards as a deployable resource. And once all that's done, you get put on a list and you have the ability to respond downrange and help. And uh, of course, here, Shares Winlink uh, remains a major component of our PACE planning. All right, so what, what type of technology for MCOM? And, uh, you know, this, I just, this is a parting thought, is why would I want technology that relies on the internet to work with emergency communications? We hear it all the time. Eh, that's too complicated. You know, DMR always comes up with that, that topic. But at the end of the day, um, we, we leverage technology when it's available. And then when it's not, we still know what to do. But if we didn't progress, if we thought about where computers and radios and things were 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, if we didn't progress, you, you wouldn't be watching this presentation on this on uh, the computer right now. So I encourage you to uh, get out of your comfort zone. Look how you can leverage technology and uh, incorporate it in emergency communications. Uh, please get involved and uh, try to foster those relationships. Um, you know, a good saying in, in uh, interoperability is, and this is a good one, is uh, interoperability is uh, technologically possible, but politically improbable. <laughs> and that's a good one to think about and to scratch your head on. But we have a lot of technology out here, but the biggest one is politics and relationships. And that's what makes all this stuff work. So I encourage you to work on that as well. All right, so that uh, concludes uh, the presentation. I hope uh, just to, to wrap it up, you uh, at least have a better understanding of what a healthcare coalition is, uh, some of the resources that are available, and uh, how healthcare leverages some of these resources, and then uh, you know how you integrate in with uh, the NIMS and ICS system and. Uh, Again, if, if I offended anybody, please don't take it personal. It's just the facts. So uh, here for any questions um, or anything that anybody has. Okay, uh, we got a, you have the chat up there. We got a ton of questions in chat there, Matt. All right. Yes. Let's uh, let's pull that up. And I moved it out of the way. If you and lower your desktop and just this. this uh, oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Stand by. We don't want to do all that. So let's see. Good call. Uh, Good let's stop sharing. All right. Let me let me look at this uh, chat window here. And I apologize. I'm running a little. I'm uh, not on my A game here. All right. Uh, working on it. All right. So here we go. I was about to say it's a mass unit. How cool. Yes, sir. That is, uh, that is correct. That's what that is. Uh, uh, yep. A lot of resources in that warehouse. Uh, and, you know, probably the, the most recent example of that is uh, PPE and ventilators. So during COVID, um, PPE and ventilators was, uh, so we actually transitioned the whole region. The PPE and ventilators came through our warehouse. Who paid for that hospital mass unit? Great question. Uh, so the way that works is that is paid for by DHHS and ASPR, which is uh, Health and Human Services. And the, yeah, I think it's changed now, but it's the Assistant Secretary to public response, I believe. Um, so essentially the feds paid for that. My position is a uh, grant funded position. So the money travels down from the feds down to the state and then travels to the level one trauma centers. And that's how, so every level one trauma center has those resources here in North Carolina. Uh, yep, Western Shelters, we do have DLX. Uh, question, what portable phone system do you use? Well, we have uh, Cisco call managers on the vehicle, also some portable flyaway uh, 
Cisco call managers. But you know, really, the, the problem with that is uh, it's complicated to program call managers. So you got to be pretty squared away on the IT side. So a lot of times when we go somewhere and provide a phone for an EOC, emergency management, it's a plain James, what I call a Barbie phone. It's a uh, old fashioned copper, copper telephone. And uh, that's what we provide. Do you use APRS? Uh, not really. It's, um, uh, we, we do a lot of that through other technology, but um, so not much. Just getting started in the shares, highly recommended. Yes, I agree. Uh, if, if you're an agency, I, I fully encourage you to look at shares. That's a very good resource. Uh, is there a previously recorded session on shares? Not sure. Uh, Dan, you might be able to, to comment on that. Uh, who paid for the comm trucks? That's uh, pretty much back to the other question. Uh, okay, so we have a, a shares coordinator that's on the call. So you can go in the chat and feel free to uh, operate or uh, contact him for that. All right, talking about more uses of AuxCom, we're talking about the situation unit. That's that's a good point. Uh, yeah, so there's been talk of integrating amateur NTS into AuxCom, but NTS is on daily or twice daily cycle. Yeah, that, that's really the concern is, uh, or, or the issue, the gap there is you know, from the emergency management perspective, when we need to send traffic, it, if we're at that point where we have to use amateur radio resources, we need that passed immediately. And the once or twice a day uh, passing of that is just, it just doesn't meet the requirements. <laughs> um, okay let's see uh, folks that are tied to Linux, Linux boxes okay all right I think that's most of them. Um, uh, have you updated your P4 dragons for AES yes uh, the RMS and the vehicles are updated for AES and, and why we're talking about that is uh, that comes up a lot with encryption and in the uh, in the healthcare side of stuff when we do uh, emergency response all the type of traffic that we're sending really there's no no business to have PHI uh, PII or any of that message uh, traffic on there when we're sending messages over uh, WinLink it's most of the time resource request uh, it's patient movement and things like that. So it's very rare, even if we send uh, pictures of X-ray images, uh, as long as that doesn't have, they're, they're really overall 95% of the time, there's no need for encryption. Uh, it's when you're sending those uh, things that, you know, tie back to patient identifiers, things like that, that, that you have to do that. It's nice to have AES-256, but at the end of the day, most of the things we're doing is not that type of traffic. All right, let's see. Uh, when, go ahead. when we get to that. Uh, what was that? We do have one person with their hand up to come on, but let's go through the rest of the, the text messages. Sure, okay. Uh, in your view, will Starlink displace most of the existing comm systems? Um, no, I, I think it'll be a tool. I think it's a great tool. I think it's new technology. I hope eventually you'll be integrated into cellular telephones. Uh, so when you, you know, we have a cellular outage, you, uh, you, you can still use uh, satellite. I consider Starlink just another tool in the box. Um, it definitely is not perfect, uh, but it is doing very well right now. Uh, let's see, FEMA region. Okay, NTS, our ideal is virtually along. I think you've got all of them. Yeah, I, th I think that's most of them. Yeah. All right. Dan, you want to come on with your question? Yep. Oh. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. I do have several questions and a couple of comments. 
Your uh, hospital in a box has 32 more beds than our county's hospital has, <laughs> just to, for context. And um, I, I use my cell phone over Wi-Fi, which is on Starlink, most of the time I'm in the house. Um, so in that sense, that's already addressed. But um, the questions were, when you, are your shares drop kits for hospitals uh, just shares WinLink or also voice? Great question. Um, honestly, from our perspective, we rarely, if ever, use shares voice uh so from from an from an agency perspective uh it's almost exclusively uh shares one link for passing of traffic uh, and that's it, it's a lot easier to train folks how to hit you know send receive and, and do uh kind of native email clicks than to actually get them uh to get a doctor to pick up a microphone and try to well, within reason, communicate uh, with proper procedures on the shares frequencies. So almost exclusively just one link. Copy that. Okay. And did I mishear you? Was that a 50 gigabyte or 50 megabyte wireless link for that 12-mile hop from the tower to a hospital? A 50 meg. Uh, so 50 oh, megabyte. Okay. I'm, I'm, I did mishear you. Yeah, um, 50 gig would really be nice, but I haven't figured that out yet. Well, well, everybody's working on that. Stand fast. Um, I wish. And and how expensive is that cracking SDR direction finder? Uh, last I checked, I want to say it's about $400 for the hardware. And that does not include the Raspberry Pi 4 that have to go uh, has to go with it. So, and then of course you need a Android tablet if you want to do the uh, directions with it. So probably all said and done, probably seven, 800 bucks. But the feature that that thing provides commercial equipment is, you know, equivalent to 50 or $60,000. So it's, it's a very cool little inexpensive tool. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I do have some questions, maybe not so much for this group about, um, so you're basically embedded in two ESFs and how's that working out for you? That's a, it, that's, that's a great question. Actually, uh, that's a fantastic question. So yes, we're, we are technically ESF eight, but when the calm role comes to fruition, we're, we're functioning under ESF two. Uh, so we do do both. Um, there's some missions we do that are just ESF2 missions. And then there's some missions that are ESF8 that have some communication components in there. And uh, so it's, I, it's kind of a mesh. Uh, we're kind of keeping, keeping in touch with both sides of the house, um, which is kind of unique. Not a lot of folks uh, do that. All right. Thanks a whole lot. I accidentally got more work done today than I intended because my ICS 400 was worth um, a whole lot of uh, the uh, hours needed to renew my NREM credentials. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. Uh, I'd like Thanks to bring the attention everybody. Keep an eye on the chat. We have uh, like Steve uh, Waterman and other people putting some answers and comments in there that we're going back and uh, reading. And let's pick up uh, Rick. Uh, do you want to take the floor there, Rick? Hi, Matt. Thanks for your presentation. I really, really appreciate that. Um, here in Indiana, we're actually in the early phases of building out uh, what we hope to be a program much like yours someday soon. But the question I've got for you is: What do um, have you guys have you guys over the years run into issues with uh, the standards for what it takes to be an oxy? Um, I fully support and agree with those standards in terms of. ICS compliance and, and PTBs and things like that. Um, but my question is, has that created problems filling out uh, your roster, essentially? Have, have you had a lot of people say, you know, that's a great thing, but I'm not interested in giving up my, my former affiliation? Uh, Matt? Go ahead, sir. Uh, this is Steve Waterman. Uh, Tom Brown, um, they uh, concerned about standards uh, and uh, how that might impede uh, the uh, audition and use of emergency management. Could you tell 
this gentleman the number of ICS, uh, or excuse me, NIMS compliant uh, people you have as volunteers that have taken 100, 200, 700, and 800, if you're still here. <laughs> I, I hope you're still here. Hey, yeah, th this is Tom in North Carolina. Um, just the ones who've taken the four courses, I don't even know, probably a thousand or something like that, maybe, I don't know. But the ones that have actually complied with with uh, taking additional training and those that have uh, ha actually have a relationship with an uh, authority having jurisdiction, which is what we require. You can't have a ham just drops in from a club and goes to work. So uh, and when we teach the uh, Oxcom classes, we have three uh, three instructors, uh, it's the state sponsored instructors. So you have to have an affiliation with an AHJ just to get in the course. So it's not a big deal. Uh, and we have a data, we have a database here that has nothing to do with any agency or group outside of North Carolina. And we track, uh, we track those folks and we do not accept a transcript. We want a copy of your, your form, your, your PDF. And we, we actually validate the metadata in those back with the Fed, just to be sure it's, it's not a picture of a ham sandwich or something there. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, if, if I might just take one more minute and just tell you this. So this is this started, all this started in North Carolina in about 2005, when the governor put out a proclamation and said everybody was going to be NIMS ICS compliant. It worked for anybody in the state. And then the Stafford Act got passed, which means that nobody can get reimbursed for for uh, expenses for, for hurricanes or whatever if you can't demonstrate that everybody's trained and we kind of pushed back about on some of that for a couple of years and some people got really belligerent about that and then about 2010 uh we had a meeting at the state eoc uh, on a saturday and a guy from emergency management said get in or get out and that was pretty easy to understand so that's that's the you have to have a relationship with the, with your em people it can't be a club it can't be some bunch of guys that just get together on saturday morning and and talk about ham radio whatever it takes a commitment you've got to get burnt and get dirty and go do things but if you do that you'll be accepted i'm sorry if that was too much folks tom out yeah no, i appreciate i appreciate the answer gentlemen for sure yeah and that and just to follow up um you know, so we have a variety of COMEL, T's, Oxcom uh, folks on the team. But, you know, I've been to some of the, the local groups that are still hung in what I call 1985. And I said, look, guys, if you want to get involved, this is what you got to do. And uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very hard road. So, and I, I, don't know, I don't know how to correct that. Well, I might jump in here real quick. You guys are doing a good job already. Uh, we need to do more of it like you're doing tonight. Um, we, when I first started these sessions like this for all the hams and such, about uh, two and a half, almost three years ago now, I think, uh, when they talked about WinLink, it was like boo boo and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was a, now it's a commonplace and the different states are taking hold of it. We're getting more and more people involved with shares, more and more people involved with the various uh, uh, federal and state uh, level. And I think we need to keep that ball rolling. We need to um, we we need to bring in the people who don't know, who are, have that interest. In other words, uh, uh, we can't, there's no use trying to sell to the people that's already sold. <laughs> we need to keep selling to those that need to understand and work with us. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Matt. Yes, sir. No, I, I totally, uh, totally concur. I think there's another hand up and I saw another question. Um, uh, let's see from Mike. Hey, Mike, hope you're doing okay. Uh, it says, can you explain how Starlink can be retained on standby until needed? Uh, so the way, of course, this is a moving target, but right now with some of the, the versions of Starlink, you can put it in suspend mode. Uh, so you buy the hardware for 600 bucks. Uh, it's 135 bucks for the uh, RV plan, but you can put it in suspend mode and then spin it up when you need it. And uh, we've tested that and it takes about no more than 30 minutes by the time you click activate. And uh, so, you know, for folks that have some financial difficulty, that may be an option for you to have on standby. Is that a, a federal thing with Starlink, or is that available to the everyday person? That is available to the everyday person. Okay, because they didn't used to do that. Um, you had to be there 24 by 7. 
Okay, uh, Victor, you got your hand up. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, Matt, <clears throat> I'll go back to that question a few minutes ago about get in or get out and reaching new people, as Dan suggested. We typically run about five to ten people on our weekly ops three, and our fifth Saturday drills are. You know, fifth Saturday, which works out to about four to six exercises a year. Is that enough to be considered full commitment? Or we talked about it a little bit last week. Is this something that should be done monthly or every two weeks? You have a feeling expressions on that. Thank you. Sure. Thank yeah. You. Well, I heard someone else. Go ahead. That was just me. I was just, this is Tom. I'm impetuous. I was just going to jump in and say this. So the first thing is that, that if, if you're an amateur radio guy uh, or something like that and, uh, and you want to participate and make a difference in the, in the area where you live, in your state or county or wherever your authority having jurisdiction is, that's federal, state, and, and county. It doesn't go below that without a statute. So, so in every county in North Carolina, there's 100 counties and I guess two or three of them are too small, not enough tax base, so we don't have 100 EMs, but probably 90 or something like that. You need to be on a first-name basis with that guy or girl, whoever it is, a lady. You need to know who they are. They need to know who you are. And you can't go in and say, I'm, I'm, I'm the XYZ, and I, I can do all this for you. You have to go in and say, I, can have, I have some capabilities. What would you like for me to do? And if they tell you to go talk to shelters, you know, Thursday and Friday, don't just do it Thursday and Friday. Do it 15 times. Give a spreadsheet and go back and build a relationship with these people. You can't just get a bunch of hams sitting together on Saturday. I'm just not, not, not meant to be insulted. You can't get together on Saturday morning over breakfast. All of us like that. It's fun. But you can't do it on that basis. You need to be in touch with, with the agency. The agency, these guys, two or three times a year, have tabletop exercises, if nothing else. You need to be involved in those. It means it might be a Tuesday. Well, I mean, if you've got a full-time job, maybe you can't go, but maybe somebody else can. So, and, 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 and if it's the only time you got to work so on Saturdays, you got a problem anyhow, because down here, hurricanes usually come out on Monday and they end on Saturday. So, but uh, it, it takes a commitment, and, and but and, and you, everyone here is capable of doing that, unless you physically can't. Everyone here can do it. You got to put your mind into it. You got to decide you're going to train, and you got to let the agency know what you're doing and who you are. Don't bring in a bunch of hats and stuff. And I'm I'm going to hook you up with this. I'm going to hook you up with that. They don't care about that. They want you to do their work. That's why they're asking you to come in. You're doing you're doing their work for them, and not the other way around. Over. I might pick up here for a second. As most of you know, I'm a section manager, ARL section manager for the state of Idaho. And one of my pet peeves, I keep uh, pushing back on, if you are an EC, a DEC, or in any other program, be in, uh, it doesn't matter what you're, what you're let, with, that often works well at the local level. In other words, you're helping the sheriff. The, the, you're doing all that kind of stuff under that hat. When it comes to the... Uh, what happens when the crap hits the fan, they need to know who you're going to be loyal to. So if you are involved with the EOC someplace and you're wearing an EC hat, I recommend that you get an assistant EC. So that assistant could pick up the slack so you can go do the job that you committed to at the EOC. If you see what I'm saying, don't don't uh, be a person that's collecting hats and, and brag stuff and then can't do a decent job with any of them. Okay, Dan, you got your hand up. Mr. Dan. Yeah, I, well, actually, I had a question for Matt that I forgot. So I'm going <laughs> to reprimand you, Big Dan, because I thought we were going to make it through this without anyone saying a double -R -L. Oh, boy. Was that a question? No, that's not a question. I'm reprimanding okay. Big Dan. Oh. Okay, roger that. Well, I have to because... My other hat, if you will, is I do represent the ARL, and I know always agree with them, and they have their problems too. But when it comes to disasters, we all have to be on the same page, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm working for. Um, you know, there's also there's the Mars program. There's all kinds of programs out there that uh, kick in the gear. So, anyhow, I'm sorry about Finn, you were bringing up the ARL. 
but they are the, the white elephant. Hey, yeah, but, just, Dan, I belong to the Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club. Yeah. But that doesn't have anything to do with, with this. Just, just remember, at the end of the day, uh, the average emergency manager has never heard of the ARRL, doesn't know what the ARRL does. So all those hats that we wear, uh, like, like you just said, they're auxiliary communications. Remember, task-oriented. So just try to keep that. And you still can call yourself whatever you know it is you call yourself. But at the end of the day, when you integrate with emergency management, you are task-driven and you're an auxiliary communicator. Actually, in the sphere of all emergencies are local, I think what you, what's valuable more than anything else is who do you talk to about specific problems to get them solved? And uh, that's what emergency management is. We need to keep that in mind. And, you know, however many dues you pay every year or month or for a lifetime, just don't have any influence on whether I want to talk to you when I got a specific problem. Thank you. I'm done preaching. Okay. I, it looks like you have a new radio there now too, Dan. Okay, uh, hey, there's a lot of neat, uh, familiar faces. Yes, we have had some uh, presentations in the past on shares and other such things. Uh, check it out on the Rat Pack thing. Uh, and we look forward to having more. I think there's a lot we can do in this area. There's a lot to offer on both sides of the scale. And I can think we can work together very much. So and uh, we'll support that 100%. Okay, back to you there, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, that's that's all I have. Um, uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, taking the time and uh, and and listening to me, especially in a less than uh, ideal uh, condition. So, uh, unless there's anything further, I'm going to go uh, hit the rack and uh, get some rest. All right. The fact that you're here is testimony to everything you're talking about. So, amen on that. We really appreciate it. Yes, sir. As they say, glad to be here, part of the team. Help out any way I can. Thank Remember. you. Thank you for bringing your mentors with you. Yes. Who also. <laughs> yeah. um, all of you guys, it's good to see you here. Right, please. Appreciate that. Are there anybody else out there? I want to give a special thanks to Steve Waterman, who is the primary person behind these kind of things. I, he's part of our uh, Rat Pack team and a, a very valuable resource. He's brought a lot of stuff on the table here that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And uh, so thank you, Steve. We appreciate your efforts. Okay, with that, folks, I'm going to say uh, 73s to everyone. Appreciate everybody showing up. And uh, we'll shut her down for a night, and everybody have a great weekend.